Hey friends, I'm here with a very special guest, Professor Kirk Atkinson. And in today's conversation, we're gonna be talking about all things to do with small modular reactors, also his experiences working in the UK, in the United Kingdom's Ministry of Defense, and also his research that he's doing here at Ontario Tech University. So uh, just to start off, uh, I'd love to learn about how you got started with the nuclear energy industry and the origins, and also a little bit what about what you do here at Ontario Tech as well. Okay, so I'm getting on a bit now. So I was born in the 70s and uh, I grew up in the UK, you know, near to, uh, near to London, just outside of London. Uh, and when I was growing up, it was, it was the back end of the Cold War. So there was always lots of discussion about whether the, the Russians would attack the UK. And uh, there were like pictures in, in, in books that talked about if there was a nuclear bomb in the middle of Trafalgar Square in London, what it would do at different distances away from the city. Uh, and where we lived was, well, I don't know, maybe 30 miles away from, from, the, from, from that point. And it always made me you know, a bit surprised when it said that the tires on my dad's car would have melted. And so being a young kid hearing this kind of stuff, growing up with this kind of uh, thing, it got me interested in radiation, got me interested in nuclear. Uh, as time went on, I went to university uh, in the 90s. I studied physics uh, in London and did another couple of degrees in physics and eventually got a PhD in, uh, in uh, applied radiation physics. At least that's the specialty. Uh, I did a whole bunch of work in radiation over the years, different, different uh, topics. I worked in medical, I worked in, in big accelerators. And then I, uh, I answered a job ad to go and work in the, uh, for the Ministry of Defense, working in the nuclear department, uh, which is a training and education department and a research consultancy uh, function. Uh, on behalf of the UK Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program. Uh, and the Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program uh, is responsible for delivering nuclear submarines, nuclear-powered submarines uh, for defense purposes, you know, and uh, naval reactors are effectively the canonical form, the original type of, of small modular reactor. Uh, and so when I came out here in the beginning of 2019 to, to Canada to work at Ontario Tech, uh, I brought that experience, which is a little bit different to the can-do experience we have here in Canada. Yep. Uh, and that's what I've been trying to leverage since I arrived. Uh, my research is, has a focus uh, on the SMR file, uh, uh, as well as the nuclear industry more general. That's great. That's, that's phenomenal. And, you know, small modular reactors is pretty much the future of, uh, of nuclear power, uh, especially here in Canada. So could you tell me a little bit about uh, your experiences uh, in the defense industry? Also, you know, the f very first kind of small modular reactors were submarine reactors. So tell us a little, little bit about, you know, uh, the manufacturing approaches or the, the whole history there in terms of making small reactors and assemblies, an assembly line. One of the reasons that people haven't really done too much or heard too much about the successes in the small modular reactor field uh, over, the, over the years is because defense by its very nature is a classified industry. Much of the, the technology that's used and developed and has been used over the years and trialed uh, for submarine reactors and in the US aircraft carriers too uh, is, is classified. Uh, so it's taken a while to gain that, to get that experience out of out of that kind of uh, industry into the wider, the wider scene. Now, for, for the longest time, across the border from here in the US, the, uh, the US Navy has been a really big provider of, uh, of operators to go and work in, in, the, uh, in the plants, yeah? because they have a, an education system, training program, that is, that is you know, like second to none. Yeah? The same thing is true in the UK. Uh, so the UK has been running nuclear submarines since the 60s, yeah, uh, or the late 60s. Uh, and over that time, uh, its first reactor was given to us by the US government under a, a, under a mutual defense uh, agreement. And that reactor was what we, what we term in the UK PWR1. So it's a pressurized water reactor, number one. Uh, it was sufficient. It was a, a distributed PWR design rather than an integrated design. Um, and it was sufficient to 
power submarines, yeah. uh, both propulsive and, uh, and, uh, and for its other needs, its electrical needs, which they term hotel loads, which I always found a bit you know, humorous. Over the years, uh, lots of evolution happened around the design. They worked on increasing the core lifetime so that they could minimize the need to, to refuel. Refueling a submarine is kind of difficult because it's a big tin can that needs to be pressurized, works in a pressure-bearing pressure, uh, uh, pressure bearing environment. So opening the boat, you know, creates a problem, you know. So refueling is something to try and be avoided if you possibly can, or to be engineered out, as the French have done. In, in, some, in some regards, the way that they do it is, uh, is maybe better. Uh, so the UK went through multiple evolutions, you know, longer core lifetimes, slightly different ways of designing the core. Uh, so they then went through a, a new iteration of, of the reactor, which they called PWR2. Uh, and now they're on a, uh, the newest submarines will have PWR3, which is the third generation of the design. All of these reactors are designed and built by Rolls-Royce uh, in Derby in, in, the, in the Midlands of the UK. Now, if you look at a map of the UK and think submarines are on the coast, yeah, uh, in Cumbria especially in the UK is where they're, where they're built, and the ports are, you know, various places. Derby's in the middle of the country. It's like, you know, a few hundred kilometers away from the ocean, you know, two or three hundred kilometers away. So you start saying, well, how does the reactor get from where they build it to where it's going to be deployed? i.e. in the boat where the shipbuilder is. Well, it does. It gets transported by land, yeah, after being made in the factory in Derby, and then gets installed in a submarine. Well, that's exactly the same model of the submarine, of the SMR business. That submarine model is exactly the same as the, as the SMR business. The idea that you build large parts, or even the whole thing, the whole reactor even, in a factory type environment where you have better quality control, you know, less on-site considerations to worry about, maybe at scale, you know, submarine business doesn't necessarily do it at scale, but uh, yeah, it does more than one per year, uh, and then take it to where, it, where it's needed. And so that's exactly what we're doing with SMRs. So there's a lot of learning that can come through. Some of that has to be on trust, I think, from the people that have worked in that business because they can't share all the details. So I can't tell you what the power was, I can't tell you what the fuel was like, I can't tell you a whole bunch of things because I'd be in trouble and I take my responsibilities around this pretty seriously. But uh, the, the model is there and the, the training side uh, has been developed for a really long time. Um, they're, you know, very good pipelines. And I think the important point or one of the important points around staffing for, for SMRs, if you think about the submarine business, yeah, you maybe only need 30 to 40 people to operate the plant 24 seven, yeah? So you've got people that are maintaining, people that are operating, people that are supervising, people that are doing other subsidiary uh, services, and you need a small number of people, which is kind of a different model to what we're used to seeing with many big stations uh, here in Canada and elsewhere. You know, now there is some differences, clearly, you know, if you think about here, uh, the big the big units, you know, people have more vacation time, people, you know, you've got to allow for people being off sick, and a lot of that kind of stuff, uh, you don't worry about so much in the defense sector, because there's some differences in terms of the manpower rules. Uh, but the idea that you can operate reactors, power reactors, with a limited number of people, uh, much less than we see today, is sound. That's great. That's a great uh, look into, you know, the geography of the UK and 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 really how how the how the industry functions there with small modular reactors. Uh, tell us a little bit about um, you are the director of the Center for Small Modular Reactors here mm -hmm. on Ontario Tech. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that center and uh, what the focus is uh, at that center? Yeah. So so when I joined the university. Uh, it was more or less just after uh, the SMR roadmap uh, activities was coming to, to, to life. And I came here with 
that different experience from working in the in the submarine business, and uh, the former dean, uh, my colleague Akira uh, Tokahiro, had come fairly recently from New Scale uh, in the U.S. and our thinking at the time was we should leverage some of that different experience, different to Canada experience, to try and help on the SMR file side. So the center is a collective of different academics, different facilities around campus. Uh, you, you could consider it virtual rather than being, uh, being a, a physical building, you know, you work in a, in a center yourself and you know, it's a physical building where there are offices and there are, and there are spaces. We leverage the facilities and the offices and everything that's at the school. Yeah. Uh, but the function uh, is to provide some insight in terms of, you know, in terms of training and education, to provide some support in terms of education, uh, in terms of consultancy and research, um, and to develop some, some facilities perhaps to help push that forward. One of the disadvantages that Canada has uh, compared to maybe schools across the border in the US is we have much less facilities here in, here in Canada uh, for our students and our industry more generally. You know, CNL is great, they, they, they've, got a, they've got good capabilities there, but if you look to the US, they have a lot more big capabilities and their, their universities have really good capabilities. They, they, they maybe have research reactors, they have uh, big flow loop assemblies, they have big simulation capabilities. Uh, things that we might have here in Canada, but in smaller iterations and in less places. And you know, that was again some of, some of the thinking. By having a, an entity, by having a center, you have something to galvanize around if you wanted to make some of those uh, big stakes calls for whether it's funding or for new facilities. And we're having some traction, you know, there, you know, uh, colleagues have built some loops, you know, to do some work on. Uh, you know, I'm involved in a project right now that may hopefully lead to a subcritical uh, reactor facility here on the, here on the campus. Uh, and together, uh, we've done some uh, some efforts to try and get increased computational power. We're still not at the same level as the US, but we're getting there. And I think with that increased capability, physical capability, that can only be leveraged by bringing people together, uh, I think that opens new possibilities for academics and students and you know the future workforce here in Canada. So. That's, that's the kind of the aim, to sort of leverage that kind of, kind of experience and to have a collective unit on, around which we can, can build a bigger case for support. That's, that's, that's really cool that you're you know, bring, bringing uh, groups together to, uh, to achieve that mission. And, and small modular reactors, uh, especially here in Canada, are so, so relevant. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about uh, the research that's required right now for small modular reactors? Uh, what does that look like? Because, you know, they've been deployed. It's a technology that's mm -hmm. been tested, true and tested in the past, it, it, you know, in, in the UK and in, in the United States with the submarines. Um, could you tell us about the R&D that's going on or, or some of the research that you're involved with? Yeah, I mean, now this is a, this is a, big, a big area of lots of nuances and different angles depending on the technology that we're talking about. If we look to Darlington, yeah, where we're going to have first of a kind of the BWRX 300, that's great. That's fantastic. That's the 10th generation BWR technology from GEH. That's quite a mature technology in, in many respects. Yeah. There are obviously facets of the SMR design that are different, but at its core, it's a light water moderated, light water cooled boiling water reactor, of which a third of the US civil fleet is BWRs. So you look at that and say, there's a lot of experience in running BWRs, a lot of experience in understanding how the fuel reacts with uh, its, its environment, lots of you know, understanding of you know, the control technologies and the lifetime and how the fuel burns up, and all those different kind of things. Then you've got some of the more new things, the new construction methods. You know. 
So my understanding is that GH is going to be using uh, steel bricks for, uh, uh, as a civil engineering side of things to get away from the more labor intensive uh, rebar and poured concrete. So there's some advantages there. So they're small iterative advan uh, advances that maybe need less R&D effort because it's a mature technology. That's one of the reasons that OPG picked the technology because it is more mature and there's less risk. If you want to bring something to market sooner, you, you do that. So, so there, there needs to be some work around nuclear data, higher temperatures, yeah? Instrumentation to work at higher temperatures, yeah? I was at the G4SR meeting here in Toronto and we were talking to, uh, uh, talking to a company that makes uh, neutron detectors, yeah? And they haven't even got a facility where they can test, yeah? neutron detectors at very high temperatures in representative neutron fluxes because the facility doesn't exist yet. So how do you test that? Yeah. Uh, and so this is the kind of areas where the university can play a role. Things like, uh, things like uh, uh, AI. Yeah. You know, some people have said, okay, well, why can't we have fully automated reactors? Why can't we run them remotely? Uh, these are all great targets. Yeah that you just can't substantiate yet. There are a few facilities in the world that are uh, you know, fully digitally controlled in, in the nuclear space. There are, you know, it's growing. Facilities are, are being uh, reconfigured, updated, or, or built new. But you know, the legacy is not to use you know, fully digitized things because you know, being able to rely on those kind of technologies you know, concerns people. So there's going to meet, need to be a lot of rigor uh, to be able to, you know, in the, in the R&D efforts to, to, justify, uh, to justify deployment of those technologies in the future. But if that's the way we're going to go, someone's got to do the work. Uh, and the university is a really good place to do that, you know, where there's lots of active people that work in those crossover disciplines, AI, virtual reality, all those different kinds of uh, Things so there are some areas high you know high temperatures you know some of the environmental concerns. Uh, personally, what I work on is uh, is is more around the the modeling and simulation and the assessment of uh, uh, of uh, radiological environments. Yeah, that's that's one of the, my main fo focus areas, as well as obviously uh, uh, some of the technologies around subcritical uh, reactors and things like that. So it all, it all fits into the mix, and no one place has all of the right skills or all of the right uh, technologies to back them up. So working together is really important. Yeah? And yeah, certainly if you're Canada, where you're a country of less than 40 million people, yeah, we don't have the scale to not work together. Yeah? Whereas maybe if you looked down south, they got a little bit more flex in terms of different areas, different teams of people. We just don't have that capacity here. Yeah, yeah, you, you make a really good point that we, we all need to work collaboratively mm. uh, to, to advance our technologies here. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little, a little bit about, you know, some of your cool projects that you're, you're working on right now that are relevant to the industry. Yeah, so I'm an industrial research chair funded uh, by UNINI, so the University uh, Network of Excellence in Nuclear Engineering. Uh, and and NSERC, the part of the federal government. Uh, that in industrial research chair is in the area of uh, health physics and environmental safety, in, uh, uh, as applied to, to the nuclear industry. Uh, my number one project in that is developing a code, yeah, a computer code, an improved computer code, a 21st century uh, computer code, if you, if you will. Uh, and the code that we're developing is called Caribou. Uh, and the idea is to be able to better model uh, incidents and accidents from nuclear facilities that have a radiological or environmental concern. So we can properly follow things through. This code uh, is intended to bring the assessment of, of these things up to date for uh, the SMR world. Traditionally, when people look at incidents and accidents at uh, nuclear facilities, they assess what the potential source term is. Yeah? So that could be rather large. Yeah? 
And then they, they abstract that and take that out and then put it into a different code to assess how that would be dispersed. And then when there's some information about the dispersal, then somebody takes the results and puts it into another code yeah, to assess something else. And then eventually it gets down to assessing at the human scale or the environmental scale, the consequences in food or whatever it happens to be. And those methods aren't necessarily wrong, yeah? But they're potentially overly conservative, yeah? The one thing about the, the, uh, the nuclear industry is when, when something isn't 100% perfectly well known or well clarified, we, we employ greater conservatism to ensure that the public is always safe, yeah? And the environment is always safe. We take this really, really seriously, possibly more so than any other industry uh, around, certainly up there with them. Yeah. So my thinking around this is in the SMR era, where we talked about having emergency planning zones, as my colleague Akira, he, you know, he did work on that when he was at NewScale, yeah. but having smaller emergency planning zones, uh, you know, potentially you know, really small planning zones, potentially the plant itself being the emergency planning zone. How do you assess that well using the tools that have traditionally been used? And that's hard, yeah? And so people make conservative estimates, people do the best that they can, and they come out with a methodology to assess and you know, a regulator kind of uh, agrees with that or not. Wouldn't it be great if we had really good tools that could follow the accident from where it starts all the way to the person and through the environment and everywhere. So it has all of the capabilities, yeah. Nowadays, multi-physics yeah, uh, is, a, is a big area. Multi-scale multi-physics is a big area. I've had a, uh, a relationship with people at Idaho National Laboratory for uh, you know, several years now. Uh, and they have pioneered uh, a framework called Moose. Yeah? And it's a multi-scale object-orientated simulation environment. It's basically a framework on which you can build computer codes, modeling and simulation codes, so that they can talk to each other, yeah, and not have as many of those take this result from here, put it in there, and make it fit uh, approaches. Leveraging their really good work uh, on, on the building of, of, the, of the Moose framework, yeah, we've built how our, we've been building our Made in Canada Caribou code uh, that has lots of these capabilities to sort of help Canada better assess the impacts of SMRs as well as the existing fleet and any other nuclear or radiological uh, facility that exists. But you put it there and say, okay, what do you do then with that? You've got a great simulation code. How, how do you test things? How do you know? How, you know? At the end of the day, data validates simulation. Yeah. Okay, we don't want a nuclear accident, of course. That'd be a terrible idea. Yeah, we really don't want any of those. Uh, but better quantifying the source term, I think there's an advantage there. Uh, having a wider uh, array of dose monitoring points. Yeah. Right now, we you know, only measure doses in certain places. You know, you know, people then get worried if there was a, you know, you know, imagine you know, Darlington's down the road, the people in Oshawa, they're, they're concerned about what's gonna happen. You know, you know, where are we gonna measure the dose they could receive? So I also do some work on novel dosimetry uh, approaches and the development of instrumentation for assessing uh, you know, inventories, you know, spent fuel analysis perhaps, uh, and, uh, and, and a fair bit of sort of imaging to understand uh, the weak points, the you know, orientation, the performance of, uh, of technologies uh, more, more generally. That's just one, one aspect. I, I do a whole bunch of different stuff. You know, uh, you know, coming from this, this kind of diverse background, as I said at the beginning, coming from a medical physics background and then working my way through accelerators uh, in, before I hit the nuclear business, it is, it's given me a different perspective that perhaps yeah, mainstream nuclear engineers would have gone. Yeah, they, they see things in a particular way because that's what they've seen. They don't know these other technologies because they never used them before. 
They'd never used this technique, yeah. So I've tried to make my career by straddling those two areas and being able to bring through uh, some ideas that are used in a different context to the, to the nuclear space. And it's, I've, I've done all right so far, I think. You know, it's, uh, I, am, I am here, at least by now. So uh, hopefully I've done, done something well there. But when I was in the UK and I worked in the, uh, in the naval reactors business, I was actually a technical lead for reactor physics. So I did lots of work around, uh, around reactor physics uh, and reactor performance in that kind of area, core design, uh, modeling and simulation of, 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 of those. And that's something else that I've spent a fair bit of time sort of looking at. And I even did a little bit of a foray into, uh, uh, into human factors. Yeah where we did some real experimental work in the, uh, in the Czech Republic with some colleagues there. Did that with one of my uh, former uh, uh, grad student where I was a co-supervisor. Yeah, it's, it's, it's great to see how uh, vast your experiences are in, in different areas and how you're, you're basically finding intersections between them now, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> could you tell, us, tell me a little bit more about the, uh, maybe the research that's happening in the UK and compare that to Canada, right? in the nuclear energy scene uh, and kind of compare the differences in between the small modular reactor uh, uh, vision uh, in, in between those two countries. Mm -hmm. So I've been in Canada four years now. So I'm not as up to date on everything in the UK. I would say that from, from a given. But uh, Rolls-Royce being the traditional SMR, if you want to call them SMR, builders for the, for the submarines, have a lot of intrinsic capability in the design of small reactors. They can't leverage naval reactor technology to the SMR file because it's classified. But they can leverage their experience in, in how they do the design, how they work, uh, the kind of facilities that they need, that experience, the experience that many other SMR vendors perhaps don't have right now because they haven't actually built anything yet. So they, they have uh, uh, designed, you know, some, some, some uh, colleagues of mine, or even some of them, you know, effectively friends of mine uh, that work at Rolls-Royce uh, have designed a, a PWR. On the, it's a bit on the large side uh, for an SMR. It's just about, just about there in the, in the scope of, uh, of uh, SMR parlance, if you like. Uh, so they, they've developed a, a PWR uh, for deployment to replace coal plants yeah, in the UK. There's been a move away from coal and to potentially you know, replace some of the units uh, that have been retired, like the, the Magnox units that were sort of of similar uh, generating capacity to, to this. Yeah. They were, whilst they were traditionally called big nuclear, I was talking to a student of mine earlier, and if you actually sort of do a comparison between they're the Magnox thermal powers and electrical outputs and taking into account efficiency. And then you compare it to some of the bigger end SMRs, they ain't that different, yeah? So I think nuclear actually got bigger as time went on too, before it got smaller again. Uh, so they obviously uh, are doing work on that file. And the UK has also spent a uh, significant interest uh, in, in gas reactors, high temperature gas. But one, one thing that the UK has a lot of experience of is obviously running gas-cooled reactors more generally. Yeah. Having decades of experience with the advanced gas-cooled reactor fleet and the Magnox fleet that sort of you know, uh, precipitated it. Uh, they, they really understand how graphite ev uh, evolves uh, in, in a reactor environment. You know, a huge amount of work's been done in places like Manchester, University of Manchester, where I, I used to teach a course. Uh, and uh, they're also pretty good in terms of the environmental side. There's a lot of understanding about the, the assessment of uh, the environment. And unlike Canada, there is a lot of uh, experience in fuel, uh, enriched fuels and uh, and in reprocessing and, and management of different types of spent fuel. You know, Sellafield is like a you know worldwide recognised 
place for uh, for this kind of kind of work. And I think collectively, all of that gives them some different strong points, yeah, that aren't necessarily found elsewhere, but are probably complementary to work that happens here in Canada. Yeah, we're going to need to learn some of that stuff better here in, here in Canada uh, as we move more towards the, the SMR era. You know, using, using enriched fuels is something that whilst enriched fuels have been used here in Canada, are used here in Canada, you know, we've got two operational slowpoke units, one at uh, Ecole Polytechnique in, uh, in Montreal, one at Royal Military College in Kingston, uh, we've got, uh, you know, some capability up at Chalk River and obviously McMaster's uh, nuclear reactor that you, I think you visited recently, yeah, they use uh, enriched fuel as well. But we've not really used it in the power reactor fleet. Yeah. Um, where it's been used has been on a really rather small scale. Yeah. That's going to make some differences if we really scale up uh, on the SMR fleet nationally. So going beyond one unit at Darlington, going out to Saskatchewan, going further, further out, out west in that kind of direction, maybe elsewhere in, in province, maybe out in you know, the work that's happening in, uh, in New Brunswick. That experience has to be gained somewhere. Yeah? And it takes time to gain. So learning from our peer nations uh, around the world, I think, is... Uh, is a really beneficial thing, and in, and in exchange, yeah, by being first of a kind with the BWX300, uh, which is, again is another potential technology that could be deployed in the UK, and there's a lot of interest in that across Europe more generally. Uh, here in Canada, we're going to be able to share some of that new experience with other nations as they scale up their their nuclear uh, aspirations. Certainly, some of these new uh, newcomer countries in the in the nuclear space uh, you know, is they're going to need they're going to need help too. So, I think it comes back to that working together, finding out where somebody's got a strong point, and the UK's got strong points in some areas, and Canada's got strong points in others, and the US has got lots of strong points in many areas. Yeah, but nobody's got actually got everything, and so I think we're better together then we are apart. And working together, we can fill all the, those needs. And so collaboration, again, by far and away, uh, the, the most important thing. People often complain about nuclear being expensive. Mm -hmm. By collaborating, we can lower costs, yeah? And taking advantage of each other's efforts, rather than trying to reinvent the wheel in multiple nations you know, at the same time. You know, you know, we need to demonstrate that SMRs can be built uh, to budget yeah, you know, and are cost effective. Uh, and some people don't agree with that yet. Yeah? They say that we're better off building big nuclear. And there's a good strong point for big nuclear too. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm certainly not one saying we should replace all big units with small ones. By far and away, I don't think that. I think you know, there is certainly a, 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 a space, a very important space that's filled by big nuclear. Uh, but the case for smaller nuclear, you know, needs to be made, needs to be demonstrated, yeah. Until until it's actually demonstrated, nobody actually knows. Everyone's just speculating, yeah. And you'll have the pro nuclear crowd trying to be a bit more honest about assessing cost, and you'll have those people that don't like nuclear, you know, I'm going to say it, you know, exaggerating some numbers here and there to try and dissuade the public, yeah. And I, and it's that disinformation, misinformation piece that, that really is, is disturbing. Yeah, you know, I, yeah. I, I think honesty is very, very important. Yeah. And I think that the nuclear industry in general is very honest. It has to be, it's a highly regulated industry. Uh, you know, if we lose trust, we're, we're, we're done. Yeah. So we take things exceedingly seriously. You know, you know, people often complain, oh, we've heard about this event that's happened there, or, or this number's not right. Yeah, that's because we report those numbers. Yeah, think about all those industries that are not regulated, or where there's a call to deregulate them. Yeah, that you don't have any of uh, any any knowledge about what's actually going on, and then lo and behold, 
years later down the line that you find out that, you know, maybe it should have been uh, like asbestos, you know, you know, yeah, it, it wasn't immediate that we knew that asbestos was bad for you. It was used in a great deal of places, you know, now we take it seriously. Uh, but it takes some time. Then thankfully from the, from the beginning, the nuclear business has taken this a lot more seriously and the rigor is certainly, uh, after some unfortunate events in the, in the last century, the rigor around the regulation is, is very, very high. Uh, so, but the case for SMRs needs to be, needs to be made by making them. Yeah? You're not gonna be able to do it as a, as a desktop kind of exercise, because you know, everything then is just a guess. Yeah? Uh, as we've seen in, uh, due to the Ukraine war, the price of something can change in a matter of months. Yeah, up or down. We saw this during the pan. Uh, when you built it, then you uh, then then you'll know, uh, you know, how much they cost to build. You know? and we need to just you know, until we can demonstrate that everyone's going to tell us it's everyone that doesn't like nuclear is going to tell us it's going to cost too much. Yeah. Yeah, you know? and you know you just can't say that yet. <laughs> so it's so, like you know, it's it's completely a guess. Uh, I say working from the defense side, you know, I think some of the numbers that are bandied around from the, you know, some of the SMR vendors are a touch on the high side. But there are some intrinsic advantages by working in defense, you know, profit isn't necessarily a, a, big, a big thing. Yeah, it's funded by government. And then, you know, legacy of infrastructure already in place makes a difference too. And so most of these, most of these companies are, you know, if not startups, as in the case of, of a new scale and people like that, uh, if not a startup, they are having to change their production line in some way, which has a cost. And that's where it's all captured in that first of a kind, being more expensive than the nth of a kind. And so you, you, until you build it and build a few, you can't really see where that price is going to settle. Mm. Uh, but I, I honestly believe it's in some jurisdictions it will be worthwhile making that investment. Not everywhere. Yeah, yeah. You know, now some people say that yeah, we should go all renewable. Yeah, there's that that dude down in California. Uh, Stanford uh, that you know, reckons the world can immediately pivot to you know, all renewable sources. Yeah, maybe in a in a perfect world they could, but the world is not perfect by any stretch, uh, and the environment is not the same everywhere. The climate is not the same, everywhere. and the climate's changing. Yeah, so what you install today because something looks like the right location might not be the right location tomorrow uh, if you are looking for wind or solar resources you know, or hydro resources you know, we're seeing in the uh, in the southwest of the US is that you know, the water is not really there anymore yeah so using hydro you know isn't as viable as it was before yeah and you so you, you kind of look at all these different things and say okay you know there are places where it clearly makes sense to install renewable, or to use hydro, but not everywhere shares that. And so there is a really good case for nuclear in some of these areas. Uh, and I think Canada is one of those places. You know, we, we live in that weird kind of, in, you know, part of the world where the winters are very cold. Mm. Some parts of the country are very dark. Yeah, yeah. We get a lot of snow, you know, potentially or not, we've not had as much this year as maybe uh, we have had in previous years. You know, and so all of those factors, they all play a role. And if you're gonna serve big cities like Toronto or New York City or anywhere like, like, like that, yeah, you gotta think about the, the capacity too. I think there is, a, there is a, a real place for nuclear to play a significant role in, in, in power. And we're seeing it now across Europe as, uh, as uh, people reflect on trusting energy supplies to say Russia yeah, and having to, to pivot away, where do you pivot to? Yeah, do, you, do you pivot to renewables? Well, the renewables haven't worked very well in Germany. Yeah, yeah. They've made great investments in it and really you know, 
said this is going to be the way we're going to go. Um, it just hasn't worked out quite as they expected. Now, the nuclear people would have said that, of course it was never going to work the way that, because everything that you're doing is idealized, you know. Uh, nuclear is back on the cards there. They're certainly not shutting everything down quite as quickly as they are planning is certainly on the cards. But next door, where my wife is from in Poland, yeah, uh, yeah, they had a really long history about using coal, yeah, and they're pivoting, yeah. There now is a real big motivation to install nuclear generating capacity that they've never had before. Yeah. My biggest concern about all of this actually is, is we don't have enough people mm. anywhere. Yeah. So we're looking here, you know, uh, I reflect, you've, you've got colleagues that, that work with you at CCNS, yeah. And, uh, you know, some of them, you know, maybe not from the same company specifically, but from other companies, yeah. I've been brought in from the UK. Yeah, you know, I've chatted to them. I've heard they've been apprentices in the UK. They did a great thing, and they've been encouraged to come to Canada. But that means that person isn't now in the UK. You know, doing the work, good work that they were doing before. You know, if Canadians coming for our program get encouraged to go south, yeah, to the US, yeah, where the salary might be higher, yeah, then we've got less people. Yeah, and we've got these great dreams. Yeah, scale up nuclear. Yeah, you know. How are we going to do it? You know, you know, not only graduate nuclear engineers or uh, you know people with graduate degrees in 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 the right kind of subjects, but the trades. Yeah, who is going to actually do the work, do the welding? You know, do the fitting. You know, build everything at the scale and on the the time frames that we've been talking about. You know, you know if Poland goes. You know, nuclear in the way that it's saying. You know, we see big companies looking whether it's the French, whether it's the Americans. You know, you know, bringing their technologies to to Poland. Yeah, there's going to need to be an awful lot of retraining of people to be able to deliver on what the promise is. But there is a promise there. There is like a that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow kind of thing if we get serious. And I think one of the things we're, we're yeah, we're starting to get serious about the workforce. We're starting to understand that the workforce is really important. Mainly because we've started building stuff and realized we haven't got enough people. <laughs> yeah. People were saying five years ago, we needed to improve the workforce, we need more workforce, we need to make it bigger. But until we've got investment decisions, it's really hard to get people to get on board. So I'm really hopeful uh, that, that more investment decisions will be made, more commitment. Um, People will see a real path to sort of uh, increase the, the the number of people going into here, and and for the kids to to actually want to go into this this field. And we've uh, you know looking at the university here, yeah, it appears that our uh, our applications for our nuclear engineering program have increased quite substantially for this year. Oh yeah. wow! How, how much have they increased by? Uh, you know, double digit percents. So, wow. yeah, now none of those people are locked in yet, yeah, because we're not, we're not at the next academic year. But if I look around and see what the, what the step change is, they're building something, the Darlington. When you're building something new, yeah, it gives people hope, yeah. You, you're seeing something, you know, one of, you know, one of the biggest problems with the world more generally now is you've got a lot of people that don't have hope. You know, they, they for whatever, uh, whatever socio-economic uh, condition they're in, they might not have enough money. They see inflation running high. You know, they see the general you know degradation of of, their, of public services. Uh, you know, you know, not enough investment. Yeah, seeing somebody actually make a commitment to invest in something that is going to last decades. Yeah, that gives people hope that. There'll be jobs for the future. There'll be something that's sustainable and able to uh, to provide the energy needs that absolutely have to be delivered for the kind of societies that we like living in. Yeah, you know, I like having my electricity and having my lights on and being able to watch my TV and you know here and there when it's a little bit cold, turning on electric heater as well, just for that little bit of extra heat. Yeah. 
I can only imagine what it'd be like if we had blackouts. You know? People in Ukraine are seeing blackout, and it's not nice, it's not pleasant. So we definitely need the capacity there. And I think you know, people seeing that, people seeing the opportunity for working in that area, it gives people hope. So we're seeing more people come to the program, yeah, and hopefully that'll be a trend that we see going forward, uh, and it will build on itself. You know, and you know, when people see more people going into it, they get encouraged, they, they feel more confident, and they choose to make that choice. Everybody makes a choice somewhere along the line about what they want to do. You clearly made a choice to come to this school. Yeah, and you know, I think you've done well out of it. Uh, you know, got to get that message across to other people because we need those people to be trained like super quickly. And next door at the college and at colleges all around the country, yeah, we need to be encouraging people to do more thinking in the nuclear space sooner rather than later. You brought up a really good point, right? The workforce, right? Like where are we gonna get uh, the staff to, to, to do all this development, right? And uh, you know whether it be skilled trades or engineers or other other trained professionals, uh, we we kind of need the supply before before rubber hits the road, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, so y you know this has been maybe this has happened in the past as well, right? With with the nuclear industries kind of booming, uh, you know, near the 60s, 70s uh, across you know Canada, the United States, or the UK. Are there any lessons learned that we could apply? There's plenty of lessons. We just choose not to learn them. Yeah, yeah well, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fair point. Yeah. Yeah. We see this time, time and time again, is that you see progress happening in, in one industry. Yeah. It gets to a slowdown in one form or another for whatever reason, and people stop uh, training the people, hiring as many people. Then people everywhere else see that that's happening and choose not to pick that career path and go for a different one, which leads us to the problem where we're in now. So I think one of the areas where we need to spend a lot of time is that retraining stroke upskilling kind of piece. Yeah. We got a lot of people that are really skillful in different trades across the country and across the world. Yeah. The delta between that person that's really green coming out of high school that doesn't know anything yet, you know, and a fully qualified, you know, boiler maker, nuclear engineer, whoever, health physicist, yeah, is that delta is much bigger for that high school person than it is for the person that's coming in from somewhere else. We need to really figure out how to encourage people and give them the right tools and training and, and, and encouragements to come from other sectors into nuclear. Now, back in the UK, the submarine business had this you know, as, a, as, as a, a real sticking point. Getting the number of operators to work on submarines, nuclear engines to work on submarines, that's really hard. Yeah, because you're telling people that, okay, you're going to live on a tin can underneath the ocean for potentially nine months of the year. You're going to leave your family behind and maybe not even be able to speak to them for that duration because of whatever operation you were doing. That doesn't sound very cordial to, uh, to domestic bliss, you know, and, you know, having a happy family. So... Getting the recruitment has always been tough. The pipeline, it might take, you know, say, eight years to train somebody and get them to a certain level. Might take a bit longer for them to get promoted. Yeah? So let's take someone coming in out of school that's training to be an electrician working in the nuclear space. They go to classes, they take classes, they do practical, they do an apprenticeship, they do blah, 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 blah. They work their way through, they get practice, and then they come back and do other courses, and you know, you know the way the workflow goes. And eventually, they pop out as a fully qualified, ready to go person at some point in the future that can sign off on things. Well, quite frankly, there wasn't enough time to train a lot of these people, yeah? Because the numbers are too small to meet the need. So they started looking at different models, like, okay, why don't we find a skilled electrician that works in 
the general trade space somewhere else. And not only do we give that person uh, the right crossover training to be able to hit the ground running with us, we also account for their experience elsewhere in terms of seniority. And that's a really touchy subject, yeah, because you know, like a lot of people, you work your way through, you get promoted and you get promoted and you get promoted. You know, but we need people at certain areas, certain certain levels now, yeah. You know, and if the path of least action is to take somebody from somewhere else and train them so that they can enter at that particular level straight away, we shouldn't be too upset with that. And so that's one of the models that they worked on. They worked on this idea of taking people from Civvy Street with the trade skills or engineering skills and then training them uh, on, a, on a customized uh, approach uh, to enable them to fill the roles that they had gaps for. We're going to have a lot of gaps here in Canada for, uh, for work in the nuclear space, you know, trades as well as engineers and scientists and everything else. We have still a you know, good production of engineers and scientists from our universities and other universities around the world do, do the same. Yeah. So most of them don't do nuclear engineering. You know, Ontario Tech is the only undergraduate nuclear engineering program in the country. Yeah. That means anybody that didn't go and do nuclear engineering at Ontario Tech hasn't got, an, from Canada at least, hasn't got a, an undergraduate nuclear engineering degree. Yeah, but they might have a degree in mechanical engineering or electrical. Some of our, you know, role models in the nuclear space, people like John Froats, yeah, came from a uh, a background in, I believe it was electrical, yeah, and then got trained, yeah, and learned, and is now hugely respected in the nuclear engineering field. So, this idea that you have to always come from the same start point. Uh, we, we need to not get too wrapped up in, in that and think about ways that we can make the pathway to working in nuclear smoother and quicker. And whether that involves new technologies or new training approaches, who knows? You know, you know people talk about VR, you know, and that's, that's something that people like a lot. People talk about uh, you know, computer-aided learning in different ways. I do think that some of our traditional ways of, of assessing performance in uh, before somebody qualifies into a role may be a little bit archaic. So if you take it this way, say somebody has to, to, to get licensed as an operator, for instance, say somebody had to do a certain number of hours in the seat under supervision. And it's really an arbitrary number of hours, yeah? You've got to do this number of hours. Now, for somebody, that might not be enough hours. For somebody else, it might be the exact right amount of hours. But for somebody entirely different, it might be twice as many hours as necessary to, to make the grade. You know, so it's like you think about fitness, you know, you think about sports and athletes, yeah. You know, I was taken about people that, yeah, that maybe play, they play tennis and they're really, really strong professional tennis players. They play really good round of golf, yeah. They're, they're, they can play they're really good at golf or some other sport because that kind of mindset and conditioning is already there. You know, so I think one thing that we could do a lot about is figuring out better ways to customize the training uh, and customize the assessment so that people don't have to take as long due to some arbitrary rule, but we assess it on how well somebody does. Yeah, it took me five attempts to pass my driving test in the UK. Yeah. The first one I saw, I was, I was cheated. Yeah. The next three times was because I was being too arrogant. And the fifth time I eventually realized I didn't want to keep paying so much money for going for the test. So I, uh, so I, I did as I was meant to and, and it was fine. Yeah. But yeah. some people, it does take a long time to pass their test. Other people, they get it first go. Yeah. Yeah. So arbitrarily putting time scales, which is something that maybe historically we've done. Yeah. You know, and it's, and it's in the rules or the regs or the, you know, what the regulator says you've got to do. It's in legislation or it's in corporate policy. Or the union said that that's the way you've got to do it. I think to meet the manpower needs, we need to be a bit 
the person power needs, you know, being that we're in the 21st century, we need to we need to maybe revise how we assess. And another area where I really worry about is that I don't think we, you know, I think competency, checking competencies is something that I'm really, uh, really keen on. Understanding that, you know, what is it that we're actually trying to assess? What is it we're trying to test? What is that, that quality that we, that we need, to, need to measure before we know that it's been achieved? And when we know it's been achieved, then we can have some confidence in, in, uh, in that person's performance. And then they can go on and on their merry way to, um, you know, bigger and better things. Uh, so yeah, I think I think that's something, uh, and it actually ties back into research. Is that I mentioned earlier that we did some work on uh, did some work on human factors with uh, some colleagues at the Czech Technical University some some years ago, and we actually measured uh, response to stimulus. Yeah. So that it was working on a live reactor, but with certain things in place uh, that they couldn't be disturbed, and we saw how how quickly people learned to do something, yeah, to learn to do a new task yeah, in the nuclear space. Uh, and it was like, you know, here we've got this insertion of reactivity. How, how would the person learn to respond to that? And you saw really different characteristics depending on how old the person was and how experienced the person was. But you also can very clearly see a training effect. And they have different speeds of training depending on the person. So. To treat everybody the same, uh, I think is just going to slow down developing the workforce. The, that workforce topic and going deep, deep diving into the whole, uh, the whole factors of training and you know, you know, competency and also transferable skills is so important, mm -hmm. right? And I think um, you made a really good point, right? We, we're seeing at the moment a bit of a financial crisis, right? Mm -hmm. Where folks are being let let go from different industries, especially maybe tech, right? Um, and hey, the nuclear industry, energy industry has a need, right? For for more people, more talent. Do you think, um, do you think this may be a good time for the nuclear industry to recruit some of that talent, right? Maybe develop our expertise in terms of AI and, and maybe other advanced tech, technology, uh, areas and different advanced technologies and apply that to the nuclear industry? There are two aspects to this, yeah. Uh, using some of these novel new technologies, these tech-driven you know, things, with cloud services, you know, AI, you know, big data, chat GPT, you know, all of these you know, you know, things that we hear about, some of the, you know, they all potentially have a role to play. You know, the more data you've got, if you can use an AI approach to be able to figure out some long-term trend that is not observable, and to be able to monitor plant condition, I think is yeah certainly there. People are doing similar things or or talking about doing similar things uh, at various different uh, places, and there is work happening in that space. Uh, the question is, where do you go from there? You know, nuclear has always always had this human human element, because you know, people need need that confidence. So I think if we rush to do too much uh, of these novel and new technologies, we could come unstuck because they, the, uncertain, the uncertainty about one aspect has a knock-on to the other. Whether or not you could get it you know, uh, licensed in the, in the first place. Licensing generally requires that you've got some kind of justification that can be made against the performance, you know, whether that's through modeling and simulation, whether that's through an experimental example, uh, both or more. Uh, so I'm not sure that doing huge amounts immediately with that, I think we need to build it up, mm -hmm. you know, properly have a proper solid found foundation. What I do think uh, is that, you've got people coming out of the tech industry, they're smart. They can pick up a lot of skills, you know, and a lot of knowledge pretty quickly, yeah. That was where I think I'd pitch the, 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 the thought here. I'd pitch it along the lines of, could we take those people that are being let go from tech industry that are numerate, you know, you know, probably quite intelligent, and train them in the nuclear space to do something more conventionally nuclear? Now, I think there's a lot of scope in that area, especially uh, given that we are moving towards that more digital paradigm. And the two things go together, because I think that that experience would lend itself 
to the industry and give it a greater understanding and appreciation of both sides of the coin. You know, you know, the needs of the nuclear business versus the needs of the tech business. And then somewhere in the middle is probably the sweet spot. I don't think we're there yet. I think we need a, need a lot of work to, to get there. But uh, those people that are there, you know, that, that are being let go, I, you know, I certainly think that we could consider ways to, to retrain them uh, into some of the more technical roles. They won't be necessarily nuclear engineers, but you know, if they've got the intrinsic ability you know, and we've got the right training package. I think one of our biggest troubles in the workforce is, has always been visibility and the right kind of visibility. So we all know that people that see nuclear in a negative light can refer to the Simpsons and they can refer to, you know, you know I said myself, you know, my, my, my own personal history, you know, looking at, you know, the end of the Cold War in the nuclear thing there. I, I remember when Chernobyl happened, you know, I was a kid, I, I was well, about 10 years old, I guess. Uh, and I, I remember that, you know, you know vividly, you know, it was all over the news, you know. It didn't put me off, but a lot of people will get put off by those negative stereotypes and uh, connotations around, around the nuclear space. I look across to our colleagues that teach forensic science here at the school and elsewhere. If you look at the forensic science programs, you know, across the Western world at least, yeah. They get huge numbers of applications every year, yeah. Vastly large, larger numbers of applications than there will ever be jobs in forensic science. And they get that because they see forensic science in a positive light on TV shows. Yeah, CSI. 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 And, and all the spin-offs, NCIS, all, all these TV shows. I watch them, you know, and I watch them with the, the perspective of that you can't do that analysis that quickly. <laughs> that doesn't happen, you know. Yeah, uh, but a lot of the public, especially when you're a kid, yeah, yeah, you look at that and say, that's exciting. I want that excitement, yeah. And that drives them to come and look at that particular program. And once they're in the program, then they realize that that's, they're getting a good degree, yeah, but then unlikely they ever work in that business. So they go and work somewhere else because they've got transferable skills, they've got the right kind of solid education. Nuclear isn't as, in, in its daily, you know, making power for everybody, is not as dynamic a subject as forensic science, where you've got a crime that somebody's got to solve, yeah? yeah? And the, the, there's a time pressure to it. You go to work at the, at the station, you hope that nothing dramatic happens. You want it to be, slow moving and doing the job. That's a good thing. Yeah. You almost want to think of it as somebody's putting their feet up on the, uh, on the console and it's kind of like on the control panel and, and they're sitting there going, yeah, this is like, I can just lounge back because everything's working so good and is, you know, like, that's not very exciting. You can't sell that to somebody to, to come into the film. So we've got this really hard juxtaposition. All the dramatic stuff for nuclear tends to be on the negative side. All the positive stuff tends to be not very dramatic. So how do you encourage people to take a look? Because when they take a look, I think they really get it, but it's getting them to take that look. And, I, and you know, it's a problem I haven't solved yet. Yeah? It's a problem that you know, extends itself to other fields. Yeah? Uh, we have a program here in health physics and radiation science. Yeah? It's a unique program that with like real crossovers into the, both the nuclear and the medical space. Yeah? How do you sell that to somebody? Yeah. How do you tell that to them? How do, they, how do they hear about it in the first place? Yeah. How do they make that connection in the morning when they wake up to, oh, I'm going to look at that program at that particular school? And, you know, that, it's really hard. And, yeah, I, and I think that's an area where we really can do work. People like yourself, yeah, being, being uh, advocates, you know, I go, you're, 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 but, yeah, I think you interviewed on, you know, Chris Key for a while back, uh, uh, and you, you know him, uh, his work has been from a completely different sector, mm, yeah? mm. his advocacy has been quite powerful. Yeah? So I think he, he knows quite, quite a bit now, yeah? but you don't need to know everything to be, to be an advocate. How do you get people to advocate for us and, and to you know, spread the word? Uh, and, you know, we're getting better at it, but we're not there yet. And I think if we could figure out that, some of our workforce issues may well be resolved. Yeah. Uh, aside from just talking about money, 
Because you know, everybody knows that nuclear engineering people and people who work in this field get paid a lot of money. You know, much more than other fields like forensic science and you know kinesiology. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I've, I've looked at the numbers, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's astounding. You know, you see, you see how, you know, you know, I'm not going to ask you what you get paid, but yeah, yeah, you can see what the starting salaries are and the two year salaries for someone coming out of a, a nuclear or radiation program and working in the industry versus, uh, versus somebody that takes something, a different subject that maybe seems like a great job opportunity, but they get paid a lot less money. You know, so nuclear's got a lot of money. Yeah, absolutely. But maybe the money wouldn't be there if we had more people. Yeah, that, yeah. You thought point. about it. It's a supply and demand, no? That's so a really it's like, so, so maybe the constraint is that we don't want as many people. <laughs> yeah. Keep them out. <laughs> so keep all the money for ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, you you brought up some really good points about like nuclear advocacy and um, and also you know just how that always there's there's always that negative perception yeah. right with nuclear energy. Uh, you know, it may, makes me think about maybe. Uh, Maybe the nuclear industry could fund a reality TV show, right? Or, or some sort of a, yeah. uh, you know, educational program which mm-hmm. which can help students, uh, in in a trendy way, uh, raise awareness. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and it's it's really hard to know what that would look like, because by its nature, by not being very dynamic, not being very exciting on a daily basis, because everything works safely and is done properly, and you know. No incidents happen. It's not not a world of constant disasters, you know, that we're having the firefight. You know, that doesn't happen. So uh, it's hard to build a build a narrative around that. So so I think narratives would need to be built around something that's more fundamental to society, whether it's to your community. You know, uh, the community is really important. Community acceptance of nuclear power and the associated activities is. Uh, is really key, you know, especially somewhere like here in Canada, where you know we have our our, our First Nations, uh, Indigenous peoples, uh, and uh, and they they have real concerns and uh, you know, about protecting the land and understanding and how that works. So I think you'd need to play that media piece somewhere in how it benefits people, yeah, and that beneficial side. And uh, I I really don't have an answer. Yeah, I, I wish I did, but but I think if we could figure it out, maybe that's a challenge for everybody. I don't know how you make a reality TV show out of it though. You know, it's like what they're going to do. It's only, you, know, you know, you need the security clearance to come onto the site, and you know, it's like you can't touch that because you're not been trained yet. You know, <laughs> so it'd be a pretty dull. You know. Yeah, we we need to make a set. <laughs> day day seventy two in the uh, Big Brother nuclear house. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, still in training. <laughs> Going to get a site visit in a month. <laughs> but, you know, it's, you know, but this is testament to the fact that we take it seriously. Yeah. yeah sure. You've got to be trained. Yeah. You've got to be really well trained. You've got to take it seriously. The safety culture is, you know, really important. You know? Mm-hmm. And that's something that I think at schools like this, we, have, we, we make a really big effort to try and emphasize that safety culture. Yeah. How safe it is. And so, but safety isn't necessarily exciting. When things go wrong is when it's exciting. So. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, thank you so much, uh, Kirk, uh, for this conversation. We sure. we touched on some really important topics throughout this podcast. You know, like small modular reactors, your mm-hmm. career in in the United Kingdom, and and also the importance of collaboration. Mm-hmm. Right. That's that's something that I I learned, uh, or you know, we we discussed the value of, and and lastly, you know, the for- workforce and mm-hmm. why it's so important to. Um, for the nuclear energy industry and how we can grow it. So I feel like we discussed some really important topics and really want to thank you for for this conversation. No problem. Anytime. Yeah, thank you.